Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our sixth annual VIP dinner. Uh, it's great to have you here. Look at this view of Manhattan. We're at the New York Academy of Science, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you tonight to our sixth annual VIP dinner, part of the Brooklyn 5G Summit. I'm Ted Rappaport, and it's my honor tonight to be able to be part of the presentation for our Pioneers Award. The Pioneers Award is given to someone who has really changed the world for all of us in the world of wireless. And it's my great pleasure to be able to uh, share with all of you uh, a few minutes of the life and uh, perspective of this year's award winner. So please help me welcome Dr. Erwin Jacobs, founder of Qualcomm, to the stage. Come on up. Good? And as a special treat, when I asked Erwin how we should make the presentation, he said, Ted, why don't we just have a fireside chat? And I said, well, would you like to know what the questions are? He said, no, surprise me. So, uh, well, we don't have a fire, <laughs> just as well. But we're going to have a chat. And uh, so I've asked some of you throughout the day, you know, what would you like to know from the famous Dr. Jacobs who brought us Digital Cellular? So, Erwin, um, thank you for being here. And first of all, I'd like to say what a pleasure it is to see your wonderful wife and life partner, Joan, and your whole family who is here, at least some of your family. Let's give a big right. hand for the Jacobs family. Joan, do you stand up? And, and also here tonight, uh, it's a very special night for, uh, for I think, Erwin and Joan. We have uh, one of their dear friends, Toby Wolf, uh, Jack Wolf's wife. Toby is here with her daughter, Sarah. And uh, it's great to have Toby and uh, Sarah here with uh, the Jacobs, their dear friends. So, Erwin, people know that you've, you've changed the world, not just at Qualcomm, but you wrote a famous book. You've done so much in your life. And you really came into electrical engineering at a time when the transistor really had just been maybe 10 years old and Shannon's theorem was maybe 10 years old. Tell us how, growing up on the East Coast, you got to Cornell and then to <laughs> MIT. What, was your, what were you thinking and how did you get into engineering? Well, it's always a funny story. But um, I was always interested, obviously, in math and in physics and science in general. Always had a few hobbies of photography and building things. When I went to talk with my high school counselor just before going off to college, um, he advised me quite seriously that there was no future in science nor engineering. <laughs> I think he was a bit wrong, but at the time we didn't know any better. And so he first suggested ag school, but I knew that wasn't of interest. My folks had a small restaurant on the road to Cape Cod, so he said, well, you should go to Cornell to the hotel school. The hotel school. So off I went to Cornell to the School of Hotel Administration. Wow. And spent three terms in hotel. No fooling. Uh, by the way, that turned out to have some, va some significant value. I had a year of accounting, which <laughs> turned out to be very useful in the future, wow. and a term of business law. Wow. So, so it wasn't all a lost aspect. And of course, one other aspect is Jonah and I met our soft, beginning of our sophomore year and uh, continued together thereafter. In any case, <laughs> in any case, I went home for Christmas vacation, I had an engineering roommate. Yeah. And uh, he kept telling me that you couldn't possibly get those grades if you were in engineering. <laughs> Maybe that was enough to flip me. But in any case, <laughs> I went home, talked to a couple of my high school teachers, came back to Cornell a week or so early, and uh, went to see the dean of students, and told them I wanted to transfer from hotel to engineering. <laughs> Anybody that's been to Cornell knows you only go from hotel, <laughs> huh, engineering from to engineering hotel. to hotel. <laughs> yeah. So it literally took about 25 minutes before he believed me. Wow. 
I then said I was interested in either engineering physics or electrical engineering. He said, well, I have a friend in electrical who might believe this. And so I ended up in electrical engineering. Amazing. A great change. What a story. And boy, the world's the better of it. Thank goodness you became a double A. You then went to MIT for grad school. In fact, you were at a magic time at MIT. There were some amazing world changers in your class. Tell us about that, how you got to MIT, and how that shaped you for the rest of your career. Well, all these things are always you know, somewhat accident. I always tell students, you know, be prepared for change and take advantage of change. In any case, while I was still at Cornell in engineering, I took an engineering co-op course. So I spent three terms at Cornell Aero Lab. And I was then thinking when I graduated, I'd go to IBM research. And um, one of the engineers there said, you should at least apply for graduate school. Yeah. So on his advice, I applied for graduate school at MIT and for a general electric uh, scholarship, uh, national scholarship, and luckily they both came in, and so off I went to MIT as, an under, as a graduate student. Did my master's and doctorate there. When I went, I had a very good course in EM theory, which by the way turned out to be very handy later at Qualcomm. But I had a very good course in EM theory uh, with a professor, Henry Booker, who will also come up later. And um, I thought when I went to MIT, I take EM theory that had fascinated me, uh, the material and the kind of the way of thinking about the, the world. Um, but in that year, Claude Shannon also arrived at MIT. Wow. Uh, 1956. And uh, the whole school was buzzing about information theory, communication yeah. theory. And so I was easily convinced to yeah. go ahead and, and uh, go ahead with information theory. Um, that turned out to be absolutely fascinating. Uh, the first year I had a course with Norbert Wiener, wow. and I think there of were- Of the Wiener filter. Of the Wiener filter, wow. and uh, automata theory, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, he, um, I guess the class started with probably about 40 or so graduate students. <laughs> uh, when it got down to seven, <laughs> the remaining ones of us decided that we ought to get together every evening and figure out what it was he said at the lecture. <laughs> I'm sure you'd do better than that, Ted. But in any case, he heard about that and came in one <laughs> evening and looked around and asked more about what we were doing and then said, you should write a book. Wow. And so, OK, we decided we'd write a book yeah. uh, with, with the information from his, his course. And every day thereafter, he would come in and ask, how many pages are we up to? <laughs> <laughs> the book came out, and I always have trouble with the title. It's Random Problems in Nonlinear Theory. No, it's Nonlinear Problems <laughs> in Random Theory. <laughs> But it's, it got published, and it's still out there. That's amazing, Irwin. Well, that experience might have led you to uh, become an academic, I expect, because you really uh, you went the academic route. And I don't know how many people in this room know the book. I read it as a grad student. I loved it, Wozencraft and Jacobs. When I went to Virginia Tech, yeah, give them a hand, <laughs> Wozencraft and Jacobs. Still in print, still in print. I, I went to Virginia Tech and there was a wonderful mentor of mine, Ira Jacobs, who had come from Bell Labs. And the first day on the job in 1988, I said, oh, are you the I Jacobs of Wozencraft and Jacobs? And they said, oh, no, no, that's Erwin Jacobs. And uh, here you are. How did you get into academia and how did that book happen? Yeah, well, luckily, I, when I received my uh, doctoral degree, uh, I was invited to stay on as an assistant professor at MIT at the grand salary of $5,500 an academic year. <laughs> but teaching at MIT, I mean, who's going to ever turn that one down? Yeah. And so I did. And then I uh, was invited to uh, teach a, senior cor a new senior course on communication theory and uh, talk with Jack Wozencraft. Uh, Bill Davenport was thinking of also being one of the, the three people involved. And, uh, 
we thought, and I suggested that we include some information theory, which had been thought of as applied mathematics. If I said it's going to have an impact on engineering, we ought to teach it that way. And so uh, Bill Davenport pulled out in, think that was a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Bob Fano, some of these names from MIT days, uh, didn't think so either, but we, we yeah. persisted. And so we began to teach it as an undergraduate senior course and uh, went through three years and then took those notes and wrote a textbook. And um, that uh, obviously worked out exceedingly well. Yeah. Um, still in print, still quoted, still viewed as such a powerful, practical book to teach people the fundamentals. Yeah, no, it, and it was a, a, a great thing. That was back when faculty used to write textbooks. Yeah. It's not yeah. as often anymore. <laughs> but uh, we worked out a deal where um, I would write out a, an outline, because I'm only good at doing outlines of things. <laughs> he would then write some text, and then I would edit the text. And then we ended up with the, the, the book completed that way. Wow. You and Joan had been East Coast. You're Cornell. You're at MIT. You left MIT. You left the, a professorship at MIT, and you went out west. How did that happen? Why did that happen? And what happened next? Well, we had many friends at Cornell who kept saying that California is the place to be. And, and so we took Do a they still say it today? Oh, yes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Good. Uh, and so we took a one-year leave of absence just after I finished the book, but before I finished the uh, uh, addendum for the uh, uh, homework problems, yeah. uh, the yeah. little booklet. And uh, so we bought an old van. We had three children at the time. We packed them in the van, drove cross-country. I was at JPL on a a NASA resident research fellowship. Uh, there I got closer to Andy Viterbi at the time. And um, we spent nine months. We went camping around different parts of California. And we decided it would be a great place to retire. Uh, <laughs> drove back uh, through Canada, actually, wow. in our old van. And just after arriving back at MIT, I had a call from Henry Book, my EM theory yeah. professor at Cornell saying there's a brand new school starting in San Diego, University of California, San Diego, where I come out to teach there, help start engineering. And we thought about it, it was very attractive. I went out, looked around, it was just lovely, came back. But then we decided, friends, family, career, everything's on the East Coast. So turned it down. Wow. Well, for two days, we were kind of unhappy with that decision. The second day, a very heavy rainstorm, <laughs> came home from MIT soaking wet, and Joan read to me a description of a wonderful sounding contemporary home. And we've been looking around Boston wow. for a home to buy. And I said, great, let's go see it tomorrow. She <laughs> said, there's only one problem, it's in La Jolla. <laughs> <laughs> that was enough to say, OK. <laughs> Called up, it's this opening still there, we're coming, and out we went to California. Wow. And, and you, uh, you became a professor at UCSD, the, right. really the groundbreaking uh, university in San Diego in the early days. Mm -hmm. You know, this is amazing. My great uncle was the first provost of UCSD. He was at Berkeley and he came down to help open that school. We have that connection. Wow. I did not know that till today that you started at UCSD. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So you were a professor now at UCSD, California. How did you leave academia? You went to do link a bit. How did that happen? Why would, you know, you're, you're such an academic. You're here talking, no notes. I mean, you went <laughs> off and did billion dollar companies, but you were a professor. Why leave? Well, uh, we had published the book. The book had come out just the year before I went to California. And when I arrived, there were all kinds of companies in Southern California asking for consulting. Um, obviously, you just consult a day a week. Yeah. And uh, I mentioned that on a trip back from NASA Ames, actually. We were flying together, Andy Viterbi, Len Kleinrock, myself. And I said, you know, there all, are all these requests for consulting. They said, oh, let's start a company and share the consulting. So that's how Linkabit started. Really? Actually, where the name come from, Linking Bits, it's wow. a little more familiar now. But oh. we sent in a list of about 15 names to the 
Secretary of State in California, and the first 10 of them were thrown out. The 11th was Winkabit. I'll be. Yeah. That's amazing. So it started as a consulting company, but very quickly began to grow. So we had to hire a few people, including some students that had come out from MIT with me to finish their thesis. And um, I decided perhaps I'd better take a year's leave of absence in 71, 72 to uh, get things better organized. And so I took a year off. Turned out that that was great fun as well. And then had to make a decision whether to go back to academia, which was also great fun, or to stay in teaching. And thinking about it, I decided that I've been telling students for years that all this theory could be useful in practice. Yeah. Yeah. And here was an opportunity to prove it. You might not remember, but a year or two before, there was an information theory uh, working group in, in uh, Florida. And at that time, everybody said coding. The, the yeah. world is dead. There's not going to be yeah. any more things in the No information. physical layer. Physical layer is dead. Yeah, all dead. <laughs> yeah. So, they still say that today. <laughs> so had to go ahead and somehow show that, in fact, there was something quite useful there. Wow. That's amazing. So you and Andy started Link a bit, and you went on to pioneer the VSAT revolution. I mean, tell us how that company grew and what, what that was like and who the people you met there that eventually became part of Qualcomm. Yeah. Well, actually, the uh, first uh, nine years of Link a bit, we mostly did government works. So one of the early contracts we won from DARPA, OPERA at the time, was to extend the ARPANET over to Europe. And uh, we were leading a whole group of companies to extend it over. And so I found that the only way to manage that was to use the ARPANET for email. So I became hooked on email at that point, <laughs> which turned uh, useful later. Yeah. Um, we did complete that. And then we had a test um, in 1977. Uh, connecting three networks, the ARPANET, the SATNET going to Europe, and a packet radio network that never really went any further. Um, but that was the first use of the internet protocol to actually wow. send data over multiple networks, which none of us really thought about very much. But in the reason I remember the year, yeah. in 2007, the um, uh, Computer History Museum called us all back together wow. to have an anniversary celebration. Amazing. So that was fun. So that was one of the jobs, uh, one of the tasks at Linkabit. Um, another very interesting one, we had a, uh, actually initially, a contract request from, uh, subcontract request from IBM. They were to bid a TDMA satellite terminal to the uh, Army at Fort Monmouth. And um, they asked us if we would do a thing on decoding. And we said, obviously. Uh, but then, looking at their approach, they were using one big computer to control all these various aspects of the terminal. Uh, it was a big TDMA terminal, um, multi-user. And so thinking about it with another engineer, Klein Gilhausen, who yeah. contributed to a lot of the things that we did, um, came up with the idea, no, rather than one computer, there should be multiple computers. And so uh, we went back to IBM, explained our idea. They turned it down as far as their prime proposal, but they agreed that they put in it as a supplementary proposal, which they did. It would have cut the cost almost by a third hmm. if they had gone that path. Yeah. They lost the contract to Raytheon, I think, by a few hundred thousand dollars. And so that didn't go ahead of time. By the way, I don't think Raytheon ever finished that terminal. <laughs> um, they should have listened to you. Right. <laughs> but the Air Force remembered that proposal. So then we had a request to build a, term a satellite terminal for an airplane uh, to deliver a special message. I won't get into the <laughs> details of that special what year message. Was this? Uh, this was in the uh, late 70s, okay, yeah. mm -hmm. um, or mid-70s at yeah. the time. And uh, we thought about, OK, now we have to implement this processor. Uh, and we came up with the idea, well, there weren't chips. There were ALUs. There were register chips, obviously memory. And so we came up with a 
computer built around those chips, but to keep the cost down, we only used 32 instructions, wow. and by the way, five stacks, so we could jump from one subroutine easily to another. Yeah. We're, that was the first RISC processor, wow. except it was, I think, 10 years later before it came out of Berkeley. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. And so we went ahead and developed that uh, technology, which was uh, quite exciting. And then Lincoln Lab came to us and said they were about to la launch uh, experimental satellites, Lincoln experimental satellite, less eight and less nine. Yep. And they had different modulations, uplink and downlink, very complicated because very anti-jam. And uh, could we adapt our modem to also do that. So it ended up becoming the dual modem for the Air Force. Uh -huh. Actually, it ended up being a Navy contract finally, and uh, for the uh, Les 89. How and did that get to VSATs? How, how did that eventually become? That was a little later, another project. Yeah. Uh, and I'll finish. I tell you, I, I always answer questions with too many words. <laughs> but in any case, uh, th we this want was, to get to the Qualcomm story. Right. Th this, was, this was fun, though, <laughs> in that. We managed to program this up, and there are two stories I'll finish with on this. Okay. One was I had a call from Lincoln. They were about to ship the satellites to uh, uh, launch, and could we bring our modem back to test it? They were building their own modem. Yeah. So we had to work 48 hours to finish the last details, carry the modem back, and ship the rest of the terminal on, on Express, which got damaged but still worked, luckily. <laughs> Arrived at Lincoln Laboratory. We set up everything, turned it on, worked, went for lunch, came back, turned on the reverse link, didn't work. Uh -oh. And um, why didn't it work? Well, they, everybody was looking at it. Turned out all the notes we had had from Lincoln were handwritten. They had misread their own handwritten oh. notes on a matrix. We oh. fixed this. Everything worked. They called in their supervisor, and they said, uh, you know, got this whole thing working. And uh, he said, well, I've always told people that Lincoln Laboratory can design equipment. I don't know if anybody here is from Lincoln Lab, but can design <laughs> equipment. It doesn't take a PhD to run that equipment. And I said, well, that might be true, but you can't prove it by us. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one of the stories. The second story on that, which I'll, uh, I, I like too much not to tell it. Yeah, go ahead. We <laughs> had, hey, you're the pioneer. Go ahead. <laughs> we had to get a contract um, for this dual modem to go into production uh, for the Air Force. And so, um, and it was classified, so I had to go up to see the commanding general up in Los Angeles. And he started out by saying, I'm, the project, I'm a project manager. As such, I have to make sure I get this manufactured equipment reliably. He said, I've been working, excuse me if anybody was here from Rockwell, but I've been working with Rockwell for years. They may not meet every requirement, but they always come through, I get my equipment. And so I was getting ready to stand up and say thank you for listening. He said, but as a taxpayer, I'm going to give you the contract as well. Wow. He did support us and we won the whole wow. production. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. So that and was, that was off to the races. And that started us in production. <laughs> <laughs> all these stories. To go into production, of course, for the, the military, you have to go all these mill specs and people often scoff at mill specs because they're much too long, but there's always a kernel of substance in each one. Yeah. And so that taught us how to manufacture it commercially very well. Wow, amazing. And then you sold Linkabit. And tell the amazing story of, uh, you built out VSATs. You were driving down a highway in California. Is that the genesis of Qualcomm? I think I've heard you tell that story, but people may be amazed to hear how Yeah, no, it wasn't the genesis. We uh, sold Link a bit because everybody had stock options. We didn't have any liquidity, and we, it was a little early to go uh, on to uh, sell stock, uh, do an I, uh, IPO. And so uh, we merged with Maycom, which was a, a Boston company, actually. And the MA was from Microwave Associates. Yeah. So they did components, we did systems. That it looked like a good match. That was the first job interview I had with Maycom DCC. 
Oh, I, DCC, yes. Yeah, I did so poorly after the first interview, they sent me home after one hour. They said, you can leave now. <laughs> it's true. The senior VP, Stan K. later said, why didn't we ever hire you? I said, you, ah. you kicked me out. <laughs> well, that, you must have got there before I took over because <laughs> yeah. I then ended that was one of my uh, companies there as well. And so um, we uh, uh, had sold the company to Macom. Things changed after a few years, but one of the jobs we had there, uh, well, we had done VSAT at Blink a bit, yeah. and then we did Video Cipher, which was another big program, Scrambling TV series. So quite, Link a bit, we did a lot of very exciting things. Anyway, sold it, left in April Fool's Day of 1985. And um, if you've ever tried to write an, e an email to all your employees to explain that, in fact, you're retiring from the company <laughs> and it's April Fool's Day, <laughs> <laughs> that was a hot email to write. Yeah. Any case, retired for three months, debated about going back to academic life, which was, of course, always exciting, going into venture capital or starting another company. But six of the fellow people I'd worked with at Linkabit came and said, we ought to do it again. And so we decided to start Qualcomm. Now, we had no product in mind, but we didn't, did know that digital was going to be exciting forever and wireless would be exciting. And we figured we'd come up with a few ideas that perhaps would give us a job. And I assured Joan that it wouldn't be a money loser. At some point, we'd reach 100 employees. Wow. So <laughs> we started working on it, and one of the early jobs we had was a consulting contract for Hughes. They had proposed to the FCC a mobile satellite system and then hired us to take a look to see if there were any technical issues with the proposal or whether there might be a slight improvement we might make. And it was after the second meeting in Los Angeles, driving back down to San Diego, that the thought came up that perhaps for a mobile satellite system, CDMA, where the capacity is limited only by interference, which means the only number of people using it simultaneously, might be a better solution than TDM and TDMA and FDMA. And so thought about it a little further, went back up to Hughes, Anybody hearing about CDMA for the first time, of course, it's, uh, that's crazy. But uh, they at least gave us a little money to continue. And so we developed a little further. We built a model satellite terminal uh, and a uh, pseudo satellite and went out and tried it. Seemed to work. But then Hughes found out that they were going to have to wait several years for the FCC to make a decision on mobile satellites. They want to put a whole consortium together. So they stopped funding us, which was probably lucky. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, they would have had the CDMA, of course. Wow. In any case, um, we didn't have the funding to go and do CDMA. We only had a few people at the time. And so we were working on a, another satellite communication program uh, for the trucking industry under contract. We eventually had to buy the company that had the, gave the contract to us because they ran out of funding. But um, we uh, uh, had to develop a earth terminal that could go on trucks and talk to KU band satellites. So one of the problems was how do you build an antenna with 19 dB of gain in it and build it for $60? Uh, at the time, JPL had a uh, group of companies working on a $150,000 <laughs> terminal <laughs> to do the same trucks. thing. <laughs> And so this was Omnitrax that ended up being Omnitrax yeah, yeah. and and I was explaining the problem with how do you build such a, an antenna uh, to our financial person Harvey White and I said well you know there are these rotating beacons on police cars and it occurred to me that a rotating beacon was wow. the right answer That's amazing. and from my course with Henry Booker who, by the way, was the professor that invited me out to UCSD as well. Yeah. Uh, I realized that, okay, we can get away without having RF joints if we stick a probe up and have a waveguide rotate around it 
and couple it in that way. That's amazing. And so that was the start. We sold that ultimately. We had a contract for it, and that gave us the funding to go back and do CDMA. Wow. Well, you, you, that's an amazing story that you were satellite, satellites into mobile satellites into mobile cellular. Now, it was 1989. You had put together this, this dream of CDMA for cellular, which everyone thought was nutty, totally wacky. They never thought it could work. And in 1989, January, you, for the first time, went to Washington to try to convince the CTIA to make CDMA the second generation cellular standard. I'll never forget that day in January 1989 because apparently right after you gave your slide pitch, I get a phone call at my Blacksburg, Virginia house from the vice president of Motorola who was in that meeting, at Mort Stern, and he faxes me your slides which you had given to Motorola and he says, Ted, is this real? Do the analysis. This guy says he can get 10 times amps. He says 40 times amps. If it can be 10 times amps, we want to invest. And so for two weeks after that meeting, you were voted down, I think. I did the analysis and probably was the first professor in the world, probably Bill Lee knew. I knew you had something big. But what was that meeting like after January when you got yeah. turned down? Because I had Eric Schimmel of the TIA calling me in March. Is this for real? Is this for yeah. real? I was You're under actually, NDA. I'm you actually say. have your date slightly wrong. We did go back to Washington, but that was to see the FCC oh. and find out whether or not they would allow a, because the industry had already voted to use TDMA. Yes. So that had already gone into the standard. But you were at a meeting in Washington, I thought, where they no, kind of said no. no well, we went, to the, yeah, we went to the FCC. They said, as long as you don't interfere with amps, you can do whatever you want, let the industry decide. Okay. Then we went across the street to see the CTIA, yeah. and I think it took 10 minutes before they threw us out. <laughs> <laughs> That's the cellular telephone at the time, Industry Association, <laughs> yeah. now Internet Association. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so we knew we had to go and do something. We went and saw Pactel Cellular, Billy. and uh, they also didn't quite believe yeah. what we were saying. But Andy Viterbi went up with me, so two of us there. Yeah. They said, at least we have to listen to these guys. And um, we went back, and they agreed to support us and, to, and arrange a meeting in June in Chicago. Yes. That's the one you're thinking yeah, of. Yeah, and in March, before that meeting, Eric Schimmel of TIA calls me and says, is this for real? I said, I can't say anything other than yes. <laughs> it's for real. He's like, really? They yeah. didn't want to do it. They thought TDMA was the one and only digital standard, but you changed the world and you changed their right. minds. How did you do that? Right. It was an unbelievable well, Yeah, at, at that meeting, by the way, there were about this number of people there, and I was presenting, you didn't have view graphs and slides, view, gra <laughs> view graphs, and um, I thought Plastics. somebody was going to raise their hand and say, this is the point you missed, <laughs> and this is why it's not going to work. And nobody did. But at the end of the meeting, somebody rose their hand, raised their hand and said, why did CTIA set this up? You have to go see TIA. I didn't know any of these initials. <laughs> see TIA and get it standardized. Yeah. And so uh, that was the beginning. But of course, nobody believed, other than yourself, that this was going to work. And so we went ahead and built uh, two base stations and a terminal, which required a van to drive it around, invited everybody back the following October, uh, November to see CDMA operating, and that convinced some of the operators to give us some support. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my career, how Qualcomm changed the world and brought CDMA really to be the global wireless standard. Uh, I have one last question before we honor you. Did it turn out the way you thought it would when you were trying to change the world in the 90s? Did you think it would be here? Did, did it evolve the way you thought it would? Are there surprises? What, what are your thoughts on what the wireless industry has become and what your contributions have done? Well, obviously, there have been many, many surprises. But the first thing I remember is we then go into a business meeting or I go to my uh, board meeting because they thought we were crazy spending all this money trying to press ahead another two years to develop chips to do CDMA and what is a prospective business plan so we start calculating how many cellular subscribers might we expect 
and of course the number came out crazy. So he divided by two, still crazy, divided by two a couple more times, and then we went in to see the board. And of course, one of the surprising things is all those div divisors by two had to be restored. So the industry kept growing very, very rapidly. The second was the religious wars in trying to go from TDMA to CDMA in the second generation. And the most famous one of those, or there are a couple of professors at uh, Stanford who didn't believe in CDMA, and one of them was always being quoted as saying CDMA violated the laws of physics. Uh, <laughs> another one was quoted in uh, a front page story on the Wall Street Journal that was headlined why Jacobs is wasting billions of dollars of, of uh, funding by the uh, cellular operators uh, with this crazy hype and uh, claimed that you know there were fundamental problems we hadn't solved. In any case, so there were the wars that went on and those didn't end until third generation where people wanted to go with data as well as voice and recognize that at that time CDMA would be the best vehicle going forward for the third generation. We had a long battle back and forth over intellectual property. I got thrown out of a couple of EU ministers' meetings at the time because <laughs> I didn't agree with them that this all ought to be royalty free. And uh, finally, we reached an agreement actually with Ericsson over third generation. They were suing us over some patents, but we came to an agreement. And from that time on, uh, 3G took off. It's amazing. Right. I know I speak for everybody in this room, what an inspiration you are. You've been an inspiration to the entire industry, and it's a great honor to have you here. Let's give everyone a big round of applause. Thank you. And while, every, while everyone is standing, while, while everyone is standing, it's my honor and pleasure to uh, to ask the uh, president of Bell Labs, Marcus Walden, and the president of Nokia Mobile Solutions, Tommy Wido, to come up and present Irwin with the Pioneers Award, Digital right. Cellular Pioneer. Ted, thank you very hey, much. You're very welcome, right. okay. Irwin. It's great to have you. Right. Thank you very much. I just want to say a few words. Um, they always say uh, you don't want to meet your heroes because they disappoint. And I think Owen is one of those cases where the exact opposite is true. Oh, Not only are you a hero to us all, but every time I hear you speak and, and talk about your experiences, it only elevates you in status. So it's just a tremendous honor. And Tommy here is my Vanna White. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a reference that some people in the room won't, ha won't uh, understand. This is the award. It's to Owen Jacobs for digital cellular communications pioneering work. And what a wonderful individual. What a wonderful body of work. Owen, it's such a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you so much. That's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, let's get us all together here. There we go. Thank you. Wasn't that something? It Isn't was. that amazing? Erwin Jacob! Erwin Jacob! That's enough. <laughs>